the upside in these silver stocks historically has been goofy. Goofy. Uh, I'll, I'll give you examples. In 1970, Coeur d'Alene Mines traded for a dime on the Spokane Exchange. 1981, it was $65 on the New York Stock Exchange. Sadly, I didn't participate in that, Andy. But a little later on, uh, I financed Pan American Silver at 50 cents with a 75 cent warrant. Six years later, it's a $45 stock. Same year, I financed uh, Silver Standard Mining at 72 cents with a buck and a quarter warrant, if my memory serves me well. It too, in six or seven years, was a $45 stock. You buy these things not for the certainty of reasonable returns on capital employed, but rather for the possibility of truly life-changing gains. Rick, how are you? Life is great. Thank you for asking, uh, in particular, because I get to talk to your audience through you. So thank you for that. You are very welcome. It's always a pleasure. So let's talk, discuss the immediate macro here just today. And I know you really have made your name and your brand through the micro, but everything's set up through the macro. And the Fed reiterated today that they're going to hold, if you would, and that's really a bad word, to three cuts. <laughs> really, who knows when? But on that news, the metals really scream today specifically, but also there's been a good setup really for the past three or four months, specifically in gold. And now it seems like silver is really starting to follow. So what's your thoughts on all of that, the overall macro and the macro on the metals? Uh, you may know uh, I have a banking organization. The consequence of that is I spend a reasonable amount of time when I can talking at least to lower level people at the Fed. I don't get to talk to the big bosses in Washington. They wouldn't like me anyway. Uh, the people at the lower level of the Fed, I think, reflect the Fed's bias that the only thing that stands between the U.S. dollar and oblivion through inflation is them. They see no fiscal rectitude in Congress or the president. Uh, and I think the Fed as an institution believes that this is not the right time to cut interest rates. They believe that the economy is stronger than the politicians would like to believe. They believe, too, that the incipient rate of inflation is much higher than the rate of inflation stated by the CPI. And they don't want to rate, make the rates more steeply negative, really negative, uh, not relative to the CPI, but really negative uh, for depositors. So I think the institutional bias within the Fed is not to reduce the rate. The Biden administration, which would very much like to win the next election, uh, would like to see rates lower, as would Republican congressmen. There seems to be bipartisan report, bipartisan support for doing the wrong thing from a policy perspective. Uh, but I think thus far, the Fed has done within its mandate, I think, a relatively good job and would like to continue to maintain, maintain higher interest rates. The market doesn't seem to believe that they will be able to. Uh, today's pronouncement by the Fed was neither bullish nor bearish uh, or hawkish nor dovish, depending on you know which sort of animal you prefer. Um, but I think it's signaled to the market that it's likely that there will be a Fed pivot. If there is a Fed pivot, if we see lower interest rates, uh, I think that the action that you saw in the metals <laughs> will be muted compared to what's to come. Uh, right. I, I'm not smart enough to tell you what they're going to do. I can just tell you that their institutional bias uh, is against it. And I, I think it's important to think about something about the real environment that the Fed exists in. People's perception of inflation or put more personally, the deterioration in the purchasing power of your savings, uh, particularly relative to the interest that you receive as a depositor or a buyer of treasuries, is more problematic than people think, I believe. People's perception of inflation, including Congress's perception of inflation and the popular media's perception of inflation, is driven by the CPI. Uh, I laughingly call the CPI the CP lie. Uh, first of all, when it's inconvenient for them, it doesn't include food or fuel. As you look at me, a rather portly 71-year-old, clearly I like to eat. So an uh, a measure of the cost of living, which doesn't include food, is of little use to me. Uh, maybe more importantly, it's, quote, hedonistically adjusted. 
which means that the people who compile the index don't pay attention necessarily to the price that you paid for your house or the price that you pay for rent, but relatively the perceived quality of your, of your dwelling and how that's changed over time. Similarly, they don't look so much at the price of your computer or your software as their perceived value, which is to say that this isn't really a, an index. What this is is a contrived measurement. But the worst criticism I have that I hope your viewers take home with them is that this alleged cost of living index doesn't include the cost of tax. The cost of tax is the biggest household expense that most Americans face, larger than shelter, larger than energy, larger than transportation, larger than food, combined. The cost of living index, which doesn't include the cost of government, I'm amazed that it's considered a good or service, but that's a bit different discussion. The idea that the deterioration of the purchasing power of my uh, savings doesn't include the increasing cost of government, to me, is perplexing. I've tried a thought experiment every year for five years where I've attempted to compute the loss of purchasing power in U.S. dollars against the basket of goods and services that I consume myself. Caveat, I'm a rich old guy. I don't need to buy much, so I don't. But I think that the value, the purchasing power value of U.S. dollars in measured against the basket of goods and services, including tax that I consume, means that I'm losing about 7% a year. Uh, right? And this draws me, Andy, back to the period 1976 to 1972 in my formative years. The specter of inflation was all about us, but we'd come off 20 pretty good years. And people weren't so concerned about inflation. It took five years for inflation to bite them before they understood the deterioration of the purchasing power of their wages and savings. When it occurred to them in 1972, 1973, it occurred to them in spades. But there was a five-year delay uh, between the appearance of the hallmarks of inflation and the market's reaction to it. And I think that we are precisely in that same period today. Think of yourself as a saver. You buy a U.S. 10-year treasury, which pays you 4.1%, 4.15%. You think, hell, this is a lot better than it used to be, 2%. You measure the fact that they pay you 4.1 in a currency where the real purchasing power is declining by 7. What it means is that you're losing almost 3% of your purchasing power a year, every year for 10 years. My friend Jim Grant called that return-free risk. Right. and. I think people really need to consider this, particularly people who are interested in traditional forms uh, of hedging against inflation, including precious metals. Right. Well, that really leads us to precious metals then. It's, um, I don't know what the exact number is, but I think it was, and I believe you told me this, it was in 1980, I want to say it was what the average person had 1% or 2% of their portfolio in precious metals. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the exact statement, if you want it, comes from J.P. Morgan Chase, by the way. They didn't have statistics for 81, but they suggested that the market share of precious metals related investments relative to other savings and investment products in the United States was somewhere between six and eight percent. Six and eight percent. And now current, where are we now? Current, current okay. number is less than one half of one percent. Importantly, the four decade mean is two percent, meaning that if people's perceptions about inflation begin to kick in, gold doesn't need to win the war against the U.S. dollar. Uh, gold only needs to return to mean. If the market share of precious metals returns to mean, the four-decade mean, it means that demand for the stuff quadruples. And that's precisely what I think happens. Remember, too, that prices are set on the margin. <laughs> yes. Interesting. So let's lead us to silver. And you've been on record and you've told me in the past where gold will lead silver and silver will follow. Silver is a laggard. And when it moves, it moves really, really quick. So yeah, let's talk about that. Gold's really moved, but silver, it looks like, and I know you're not a technician or a chartist, but it looks like silver is starting to break out some. And it looks relatively strong. And I mean that in the sense of it's just been forming a great base here 
between, let's say, mid to low 20s to where we're at today. Um, I honestly suggest no technician. And I don't offer any opinion as to whether we're at or about to break out. I would take issue with your statement that gold has really moved. Uh, gold has moved from, what, 1800 to 22 and change? A yeah. move is what occurred in the period 2000 to 2010, where it went from right. 250 bucks to 1900 bucks. Right. I don't go personally because I think it's going to move from 2200 to $2,500. I couldn't care less. To me, that's static. Music is gold moving from $2,000 to $7,000 or $8,000. By the way, I don't want this to occur. Uh, the set of circumstances that causes it to occur creates problems in our life. And I would prefer not to have problems in my life. I'm old and fat and rich. You know, I don't want that. But I believe that the set of circumstances is in place uh, that was in place in the 1970s and in place again in the first decade, first part of the decade of uh, 2000 to 2010 for gold to make a real move. I don't mean a $30 move or a $40 move. Uh, I mean a real move. Uh, I believe, too, that what you've seen in silver is more a dead cat bounce than anything else. Technicians would say it formed a long base. Uh, what I would say is very different. I would say the sellers got tired. <laughs> uh, right. You run out of supply when you've taken out all the supply. It's interesting to note in the gold market, which you correctly surmise needs to precede the silver market, the buying in the gold market has not been individuals. Uh, in fact, individuals have been a net seller through the gold ETFs. From a contrarian point of view, that's good. That means gold is still hated the fact that it's, despite the fact that it's performing. The buyers of gold have been central banks. The cause of the gold move isn't the incipient understanding of inflation, but rather the weaponization of the U.S. dollar. Uh, the stealing of $300 billion worth of Russian assets in U.S. treasuries by the U.S. government does not make other governments, particularly those who might be perceived as hostile towards the U.S., to continue to hold U.S. treasuries, um, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar through the SWIFT banking system, the attempt by the U.S. government to export their values extraterritorially through the dollar has led to a circumstance where foreign governments have no choice but to sell their dollars and buy gold. If you combine the impact of the weaponization of the U.S. dollar uh, and the decisions it forces on our trading partners, with what I believe is the upcoming realization by all holders of U.S. dollars, including American holders of U.S. dollars, that the diminishment of their purchasing power relative to the interest they receive in U.S. treasuries is negative, that's when you get a move in the gold price, a real move in the gold price. And after you see the real move in the gold price, you'll see a real move in silver prices. Gold bugs now are saying, I'm seeing this all over the internet. Gold breaks out to record highs. Wrong. In constant dollars, inflation dollars, gold is still below the, its all-time highs. But importantly, silver is trading at half of its so-called all-time highs. It amuses me to see on the internet people, you know, basically wet themselves with excitement that silver has moved from, you know, $24 to $27 or something like that. That isn't what the move's about. The move's about $75 or $85. Is it going to happen? I don't know. If it does happen, when's it going to happen? I don't know. What I do know is this. There is a probability rather than a possibility that's going to happen. And if it happens, the moves that you're going to enjoy in the silver stocks, uh, those moves, which are demonstrated by history, will justify the weight, both in terms of financial terms and psychological terms. The upside in these silver stocks historically has been goofy. Goofy. Uh, I'll, I'll give you examples. In 1970, Coeur d'Alene Mines traded for a dime on the Spokane Exchange. 1981, it was $65 on the New York Stock Exchange. Sadly, I didn't participate in that, Andy. But a little later on, uh, I financed Pan American Silver at 50 cents with a 75 cent warrant. Six years later, it's a $45 stock. Same year, I financed uh, Silver Standard Mining at 72 cents with a buck and a quarter warrant, if my memory serves me well. It too, in six or seven years, was a $45 stock. You 
buy these things, not for the certainty of reasonable returns on capital employed, but rather for the possibility of truly life-changing gains. You don't use an amount of money that will deprive your child of a college education or change your decision as to what to have for breakfast. You speculate within your means, and then you hang on for dear life because you experience volatility. Uh, but if you are right, and there's no guarantee that we're going to be right, what happens is truly a quantum change in your finances, one mercifully which I have enjoyed. You know, this reminds me a lot of the uranium market that we just experienced. And by, by, you know, by all means, I don't think it's over, but it reminds me a lot of that because I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking with some friends that, investment friends that we do this sort of thing. And we became really bullish on uranium. And I was really smart enough not to participate. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it looks really good. Uh, I should buy some and I'd get in and I didn't. And then in, in June, hey, it looks good. It looks like it's breaking out. And then here we are in March, 2024, and we are, the spot price itself, you know, more than doubled. Yep. And then you're looking at many of the stocks were 10 baggers. Yep. And so now it's like the mission of like, I see it as what's the next, what's the next rate uranium play? And I see that potentially as a silver, as a silver market. What's interesting to note is that people can understand a narrative like you did, but they can't bring themselves to action until the narrative is somehow verified or justified. That happens with price action. But when the price action occurs, the value of the narrative is less. In 2022, right. the uranium spot price was at 20 bucks. It had to go up. If it didn't go up, there wouldn't be any more uranium. And if there wasn't any more uranium, the lights would go off. It was that simple. You had to decide, is the uranium price going to go from $20 to $60, which was the price necessary to incent existing production? If the answer to that was no, you had to understand that 20% of the baseload power in the U.S. grid was going to go to grid heaven, which meant the lights would go off. So did you believe that the price of uranium was going to triple or did you believe that the lights were going to go off? That was your choice. The difficulty is that even confronted with that choice, and by the way, I probably confronted 300,000 or 400,000 people with that choice in interviews in 2022 alone. <laughs> if it, if that was the if if that decision was brought to you, most people wouldn't make the decision because they hadn't had the psychological verification that comes from the fact. Now that the narrative is proven to be true with price action, people want to be in the uranium business after the price has gone from twenty to hundred, which is to say, when the price had to go up, nobody cared. Uh, after the price didn't have to go up anymore, everybody cared. Now, I don't think the silver case is as compelling as the uranium case because the uranium case was a must happen. It was an inevitability. Silver is a can happen. It's a possibility. But what's similar is hate. People yeah. hate silver. People who came into silver in 2020, 2021, the sort of Reddit silver squeeze, were disappointed. There is no hate as sincere as the hate of a jilted lover. And silver has millions and millions of jilted lovers. There will be comments in social media after this interview. Why is that moron drawn on about silver? It hasn't gone anywhere. That's precisely why I talk about silver. The fact that it's hated. When the investment goes from hated merely to unhated, the easy money is made. And I love easy money. Yeah. You just, easy money requires a lot of patience, though, and discipline. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And to put up with, and it's annoying, that will not lie. All everybody's saying, hey, how about silver? <laughs> or how about uranium? So well, I have a different flaw in my character, Andy. Um, I'm a pathological cheapskate. And when something has moved off the bottom, uh, it's very difficult for me to buy it. And so psychologically, I have to buy at the bottom or on the way down. I have no choice. Um, 
because if the silver price were to move too much beyond where it is today and the silver stocks were to say go up 50% on their way to going up 500%, I would be hard pressed to make myself buy them. So I normally need to buy these things a year or two early because of a flaw in my character. But I recognize that it's a flaw in my character. I recognize that I have to guard myself uh, against my psychological aberration. Most people have a different psychological aberration. They require the price action to justify the narrative. I don't have any of that. And I also don't have any fear at all of missing out. Uh, I'm not a guy who wants to participate in technology or wants to participate in cryptocurrency or wants to participate in any market that I don't understand. I hope the other guy makes money. I don't care that he makes money that I don't make. I just want to make money in the right. ways that I know how to make it. Right. Well, on that, let's talk about some of the stocks here. It's, I, and I'll give you some context. Several years ago, I was working for a very wealthy family here in the state of Georgia. And we were, this was, let's say, 2006-ish, 2007-ish. And the theory was, well, we're just going to pick the biggest producers here because, you know, it, it was just risk tolerance and that sort of thing. And so that's exactly what we did. We just picked the biggest producers in the silver and gold. We're just really the commodities market here, a handful or a couple of handfuls of those. Talk to me about that like somebody coming in that doesn't want to speculate in the smaller yeah. players. Is that a valid strategy? For yeah. most people, it's a great strategy. Invest before you speculate. What you find in precious metals bull markets is that they only occupy two years or two and a half years of a decade. But characteristically, <laughs> things like the XAU give you 300% returns. Mm -hmm. uh, and the truth is that a moderately intelligent person can duplicate 85% of the beta uh, of the XAU with five names or six names, the highest quality names. Uh, so you can reduce the downside beta of participating in the XAU by 50 or 60% while reducing your upside by 15%. That's a pretty good deal. She did do. That's a, and there's liquidity there. The other thing is that when precious metals bull markets take place, the first thing that moves is the metal. But the second thing that moves are the senior producers. Uh, particularly if they're S&P 500 components. When the generalist money begins to find its way into the space, it finds its way into the highest quality, most liquid names, which is to say the biggest ones. So ironically, you enjoy quicker gratification with the big ones uh, and you enjoy it with lower risk. And at least right now, you obviate a lot of the time value of money because they're fairly handsome dividend payers. For most people, a strategy which would involve buying between the three best and the five best producers uh, in any sector uh, gives you the best risk-adjusted rate of return. I'm not merely a beta investor. All of the money that I now invest conservative, I made by speculating wildly, <laughs> which means right. that I like to come down the quality trail because I'm willing to work hard and I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to do it. For investors who aren't willing to put in the work or who can't afford the risk, they need to stay with the biggest and best companies. Caveat, biggest and best companies. Self-serving, go to the rural classroom to learn how to do that, but I'll give you a short form. Uh, you need to either avail yourself of or construct a net present value model what the present value of future cash flows from existing proved developed producing reserves are relative to the enterprise value, which is the market cap plus total debt, less cash. Then you need to look at something called the recycle ratio. And I'm going into how I construct my rankings right now, by the way, the secret sauce, which is to say, historically, uh, how have companies done at translating the margin that they received per unit of production, say ounce of production of gold, uh, how have they done reinvesting that? Have they replaced the reserves uh, that they've produced uh, at an efficient rate? Because uh, past successes is, although incomplete, the best predictor of future results. And then you need to look at their pipeline. What opportunities are, are, are available to them to reinvest? The idea is that rather than buy the XAU, rather than buy 35 companies, 20 of which you probably shouldn't own under any circumstances, uh, if you can duplicate the beta performance uh, of the XAU by buying the five best names in the space, 
while you may marginally reduce your upside because you give up optionality for efficiency, you greatly reduce your downside. And any transaction where you can give up a little bit of your upside for most of your downside is a really good transaction. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the names then. Um, well, actually, before we do that, about your ranking system, what's a good rank then? So let's say five, does that be an average? Or yeah, is... I hold many fives in my own portfolio. Okay. Uh, what it usually means, a five is, uh, first of all, a ranking is one through 10, right? right. One being ben, best, 10 being one. I'm sorry, five, yes. Five is stuck in the middle. Uh, I'm willing to own fives if the reason that I have the stock as a five is because I have all I don't have all of the data that I need to justify a higher ranking. I believe something to be true. Uh, I believe that they will enjoy exploration success. I believe management's discussion about the fact that their return on capital employed uh, will be, you know, something decent. But I haven't seen the data to suggest that it's true yet. Um, a one ranking is extremely rare, and I'll show you how hard how harsh my rankings are. I believe I've given out nine one rankings in 35 years of ranking. Uh, a one means, first of all, world scale assets, tier one assets. Tier one defined by me to be in situ value of recoverable reserves and resources in excess of 10 billion US dollars. Um, I want to have the target be in the lowest cost quartile worldwide in terms of AISC and the highest quartile worldwide in terms of return on capital employed, but at any rate, better than 25% at current commodity prices. I want a, a world-class CEO and world-class management team, and I want their expertise to be specific at, at, the, at the task at hand. You know, I don't want them to be successful in some endeavor that doesn't relate to what they're doing. I want to believe that the, the company is selling for half of liquidation value. I Liquidation value, by the way. Uh, I want to see a catalyst in place that could double the share price in 18 months. And I want to believe that there's a possibility that I could get a 10-bagger out of the stock in five years. Got it. The last one I gave uh, was Ivanhoe Mines. Uh, oh, I also want to know why it's cheap. <laughs> If I don't know why it's cheap, I don't know my risk. So the last one was Ivan O. Mines. I had Robert Friedland, serially successful explorer. I had two tier one deposits, the Platt Reef in South Africa, the largest undeveloped platinum deposit in the world, platinum palladium deposit, uh, and Kamo Kapushi, the then highest grade undeveloped copper deposit in the world. I had 93 cents a share in cash. The stock was selling for 63 cents. A very smart buyer, Cynic, had just paid $1.15 for their stock. And I could replicate their purchase for 63 cents. That was reassuring for me. Sure. So I saw that the stock was selling for less than half what it was worth. I had two tier one deposits. I had an absolute tier one entrepreneur. What was wrong? It was in Congo. People were scared to death of Congo. I believe that Kamoa Kakula would grow. Uh, and I believe that once they achieve the production financing for Kamoa Kakula, which I believed would take place within 12 months, that the stock would double. And I believed that I had the ability to see uh, a tenfold increase in the price. Uh, and that worked. Uh, you know, I think the stock went from 63 Canadian cents to 13 or 14 U.S. dollars. Um, you know, it did pretty well. I, I, I've had very few ones. Mm -hmm. And I've had no misses when I had a one. Well, what's a typical ranking that you'll get? I mean, there's a big cluster at six, uh, six and seven, particularly uh -huh. among the juniors. Sure. Uh, in a market like this, where most commodity producers are out of favor, uh, from a price action point of view, there are some companies that aren't good companies, but they're so cheap relative to the value of their assets uh, and relative to their pipeline that they've moved up the rankings through no fault of their own, other than the fact that their share price has fallen. Right. So then that leads me to ask, what's, what won't you touch? What number won't you touch? Or is there such I won't a buy anything under a five. You won't buy anything under a five? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm looking at it from the point of view of my own money. Right. Uh, and 
I am willing to put myself in high risk situations if the rewards are extraordinary. To me, it's all a trade off between risk and reward. And a trade off, too, uh, I guess it's the sa- a different way of saying the same thing uh, between net present value or prospective net present value and enterprise value. The delta between what I think something is worth uh, and what it's selling for is what I'm interested in and the probability that that gulf will be uh, erased. That's all of what I'm interested in. I don't care about market momentum. I don't care about sentiment. Uh, I don't care about anything like that. I care about uh, buying reality at a discount. Got it. Well, I'm going to give you three big names here, big producers. And Great. if you could just rank them. Yep. Uh, yeah, just for our audience, if you would. Um, let me spit them out first and you'd rank them and talk about them. First Majestic, Pan American, and Helcomani. I have uh, First Majestic at a six. The things I like about First Majestic are a proven management team uh, a- and a wonderful uh, cost of capital. Keith Newmeyer's done a great promotional job, which means he has a cult around the stock. And it reacts very well to moves in the silver price, which lowers his cost of capital. He has also done a very good job of buying large cash-starved mines, uh, lavishing millions of dollars of love and attention on them to return them to profitability. He's done a great job historically, and historically, it's been a high-ranked stock. However, they have at least temporarily broken their pick on Jarrett Canyon, and they have to fix Jarrett Canyon before I can move them up in my rankings. So what's wrong with the stock is summarized in one phrase, Jarrett Canyon. They're doing the right thing. You know, they're not wasting any more money on it in terms of trying to produce it at a loss. They have backed up. They're drilling. They're, they're doing a lot of drilling to establish a continuous ore body. If they're able to do that, if they're able to do uh, with Jarrett Canyon what they were able to do as an example with San Dimas, uh, you'll see the thing move up the rankings and you'll see the share price move up uh, pretty dramatically. But it's a six currently. Uh, next one, I'm sorry. Uh, Pan American. Pan American, I'm a buyer. Uh, I have it as a four. I think I'll be able to raise it to a three. Uh, And a three is a very high ranking from me. Um, What I don't like about it is that they issued 50% of the company to buy the Yamana assets. That meant that they felt that the Yamana assets were worth more than the assets that they already had. (laughs) Uh, In other words, I feel like I was diluted and I sold the stock. Uh, Now, the stock sells for 40% of what it sold for then. So their sins have been reflected in the market. Meanwhile, they've progressed. They've done a fairly good job, and I think they'll continue to do a good job of selling off marginal assets to uh, fix the balance sheet and importantly, free management's time to focus their love and attention on their tier one rather than their two assets, tier two assets. This is important. Also importantly, uh, they have two warrants in effect in the company, which aren't valued at all. Uh, they have a deposit uh, in Guatemala that's a 500 million ounce high grade deposit that they aren't able to produce for social and political reasons. The market gives them no value for it. If, and I'm not saying that when, I'm saying if they are able to return that to production, that deposit alone doubles their silver production and lowers their all in sustaining costs. They have a separate 500 million ounce high grade deposit in Ar- in Argentina, which they haven't been able to develop. My hope is that with regime change in Argentina and the Argentines suddenly deciding that they need money, uh, that sanity returns to that society and, and that they're able to put that project in production. That project by itself could double Pan American silver production. I'm not saying that either of these go into production. What I'm saying is that you have a warrant on a billion ounces of high-grade silver that isn't reflected in the share price. I don't know what it's worth, but I know it ain't worth nothing. Yeah, got it. So I'm uh, a truck Helka. company. Helka. Or, what kind of ranking would you give Helka my? Uh, looking at it this instant, uh, it is currently unranked. So I have no, no opinion I want to share. Got it. Uh, the other two companies I know in some detail. Pan American going back to financing it at 50 cents with a 75 cent warrant in 1989 or 1990. 
uh, and being very, very, very close personal friends with its founder, Ross Beatty. I know it extremely well. Got it. Um, let's pivot a little bit to some of the smaller ones. Um, what do you know about Adriatic and what kind of ranking would you give it? I have Adriatic as a four, uh, which again is a high ranking for me. Uh, I like the deposit a lot. Uh, I understand, I think, the geology. I've been there as an example. Uh, I believe it to be, contrary to what some other people believe, a, a volcanogenic massive sulfide deposit. These deposits usually occur in clusters or bunches. They have discovered, depending on your point of view, two or three nodes uh, of what I think will actually be a camp uh, with probably double the size of the deposit. They have completed the mine on time on budget uh, in a place uh, that doesn't have a lot of recent mining history, which is a pretty good outcome. And I think it's fair to say that they've achieved political and social consensus uh, in a neighborhood that you know went through a pretty ugly war 20 years ago, which is quite an achievement. Right now, uh, the deposit is probably zinc-centric, given the discrepancy between the zinc price and the silver price. If the silver price moves up, it'll become a silver-centric deposit simply because of the increase in price in silver. And if the stock comes to be rated as a silver stock as opposed to a base metal stock, I think it'll re-rate in the market. What will cause me to increase the, racing, the, the rating uh, will be the achievement, if they achieve it, of nameplate capacity. They completed building the mine on time, on schedule, but now you got to shake the mine in. you got to shake the mill in. you got to learn how everything works. That'll take six months or nine months to occur, if it occurs. If they achieve nameplate capacity uh, with regards to throughput and cost, uh, and if the price doesn't go up, uh, this thing has the, has the possibility of becoming the three, which is a very, very, very high ranking for me. Got it. What do you think of Dolly Varden's silver? What kind of ranking would you give it? I have Dolly Varden as a five, uh, uh, upgraded it to five from six. Uh, their success in the market has, has worked against them. Uh, which is to say, if they hadn't substantially outperformed the market in the last two years, I'd have them at a higher ranking. Remember, I'm all about the discrepancy between price and value. Uh, I believe that they may have the ability to turn two segregated, fairly small, but high-grade deposits into one much larger deposit. In, in other words, rather than looking, the, looking at this as 40 million ounces down here and 22 or 23 million ounces uh, up here, I'm looking at a circumstance where it may be part of one mineralized system, if not part of one deposit. And I may end up being look, able to look at a universe of 200 million ounces rather than 70 million ounces. That's what's intriguing to me about Dolly Varden. Yeah. Well, I really enjoy your just your critical aspect of this. I think that's what all investors could learn from you is really looking at it, at these companies critically. Not because they've heard them somewhere or not because they've seen a banner or they've seen them at a show and they talked to somebody, but taking somewhat of a deep dive into what they're actually doing in, in the books. So I appreciate that. And that really leads me to, you have a, you have a, um, the prospectors generators coming yes. up and I can advocate that enough. Because, and I want you to talk about that. We'll... I, actually, I actually have four things I want to talk about in sequence. Please. First of all, uh, rural investment media. I've graded 80,000 portfolios. I'll grade yours for free. No obligation. Go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks. Please no pot stocks. Please no tech stocks. Please no crypto. Leave an old man to do what he does. Match your resource stocks. I'll rank them one to 10. I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments have value. Second, invest in yourself. Go to the rural classroom. There's 200 hours of instructional material there about valuing companies, about translating geology uh, into economics. It's all free. No obligation. Invest in yourself before you invest your fortune. The third is, as you suggest, the boot camp. Every 90 days, Albert, Lou, my partner, and I do a deep dive into some subject or another. We did uranium, we did silver, we did royalty and streaming. We're doing exploration prospect generators precisely because they're hated and we love hate. We're gonna do an eight hour long deep dive into prospect generators. Importantly, you'll have access to the recordings of the bootcamp, which you'll need to refer to for a year. 
We're going to give you more information in eight hours than you can consume. I guarantee you. As an example, as the producer of the uranium boot camp and somebody who spent 35 years in uranium, I've had to replay the tapes four times. So think what somebody who has a life is going to have to do uh, to absorb all the information. The cost is $99. Uh, and like all products from uh, Rural Investment Media, if you don't think you got your $99 worth, gold-plated money-back guarantee. Just email me and I'll give you your money back. But the best thing I do is the Natural Resource Investment Symposium. I've been doing it for about 30 years. It is simply the best natural resources investment forum on the planet. My preference would be that you come live to Boca Raton, seven, uh, Ju July 7 to, Ju to, to July 11. The reason I say the best reason is to come live because you get to do things like follow Ross Beatty or Bob Quartermain around the exhibit floor and see what booths they stop in front of. Uh, have a drink on the boat cruise with Daniela DiMartino Booth and have her tell you of horror stories from working for the Fed. Uh, this is wonderful things, the stuff that we can't tape, that we can't have in transcripts. So the best alternative is that you come live to this conference. Second best, if you can't come live, is that you join 13, 14, 1,500 other people enjoying it in your home on live stream. Either way, live or live stream, the same gold-plated money-back guarantee applies. You will get the best big picture thinkers in the world. Not guys like Biden or Trudeau, uh, Jim Rickards, Daniela DiMartino Booth, Bill Bonner, uh, Nomi Prince, Grant Williams, people who talk about the world the way it is, not the way the big thinkers wish it was. After that, you get uh, analysts and portfolio managers from the natural resource business, not morons that failed at investment banks analyzing technology or supermarkets but rather resource people who've existed in these markets for 30 years. You get the living legends, people who built multi-billion dollar mining companies from scratch, talking about the lessons they learned building these companies and how you can employ those lessons for your product. And by the way, I'll ask them on stage what they own today and why. This is applied knowledge, not general knowledge. Importantly, too, our attendees have told us that our exhibitors are content too. They're not just advertisers. What that means is that every public company exhibitor uh, at this forum is handpicked. We have to own the stock before we invite them to appear. Sadly, as you know, not every stock I own goes up, but there is a guarantee that these are all vetted. I know them well enough, I like them well enough that I've invested both my time and treasure in them. Uh, so what you'll see is a range of opportunity there that's assembled on a qualitative basis. At every other investment conference I know, the qualification to be an exhibitor is simply a check that cashes. You wander the exhibit hall and it's polluted by the lame, the halt, and the blind. You won't find that at my conference. And at my conference, the same gold-plated money-back guarantee uh, exists. Now, in 30 years of offering gold-plated money-back guarantees, uh, my team has created a high quality enough educational products that I've had to refund less than one-tenth of one percent of the, of the tuitions I've charged over 30 years. Nonetheless, that's my guarantee to you that you're going to get your money's back, your money's worth, or I'll give you your money back. Excellent, Rick. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've been a mentor from afar for over 30 years to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that and how much it benefited me and my family. So thank you.